Good evening. Uh, welcome to our continued study on the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. Tonight is chapter 13 and 14. Um, if you haven't read it in a while, you might want to uh, follow along. Uh, there's going to be a lot here. Um, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is kind of iconic, and we will be looking at love and we'll be looking at spiritual gifts. As I share almost every week, that due to this due to time that we really can only touch upon um, subjects, but I do pray that when we touch upon the subjects, it's in a kind of a very practical and personal way um, to impact the church in our lives today. But let's begin with verse 1. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. I think a lot of people look at this and they look at this almost as a um, minimization of tongues. but. I, I don't see that. I see something else very different. I admit I'm not a theologian. Um, I do take the Bible as a whole love letter from God to us, even Old Testament, New Testament. The Old Testament shows the utter need that we have for, for grace and salvation, and the New Testament shows us that direction and, and that gift through Jesus. I say that to say this. Um, for those who believe that tongues is not for today, I'm confused. Why then is there so much mention of tongues if it's not for today? Why would Paul even mention tongues and prophecies if they're going to be discontinued upon the completion of the Bible? It, it, to me, it makes no sense. And tongues is just one gift, like prophecy, one gift, and interpretation, one gift. There's 27 spiritual gifts. I don't think you can pick and choose and say, well, one is for today, one isn't for today. I think you either believe in spiritual gifts or you do not believe in spiritual gifts. Me, I accept them all. He does make a point, and it's well taken. No spiritual gift, no knowledge, no amount of faith, no sacrifice, no hardship will gain us anything without love. And that's the way Paul starts by going into the love chapter, verse 4. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So why is 1 Corinthians 13 so iconic? Well, I doubt you've been to too many weddings where you haven't had at some point in time in the ceremony 1 Corinthians 13. I know um, in almost all of my weddings I, I use 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Both Christians and non-Christians alike um, know this chapter. Here's the thing, though. It said love is patient, kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast, it's not proud, doesn't dishonor others, it isn't self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, doesn't delight in evil, rejoices with truth, it protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. How do I say this? That's not the love that I see in the world today. The world that we see has a very different definition and feel to it. Love today um, is, is almost, I would say, the opposite. It dishonors. It is self-seeking. It rejoices and lies and it keeps records and it doesn't protect, doesn't trust, doesn't hope, and it certainly, certainly does not persevere. So that tells us that the love that Paul is talking about is a very, very special kind of love. 
Now, can a couple stay in love and uh, for a lifetime without Christ? Absolutely. But the, can they really know agape, sacrificial love without Christ? A, a unconditional love. I find that extremely hard, hard to believe. You know, what we need to do is get the world, and when I say world, I think I especially mean the burdens for our young people who, who see the example of love in Hollywood and the music industry. We got to get our eyes away from that and, and to truly get people to understand true love, and that's that agape love, that unconditional love, Christ's love. And, and how do you do that? By knowing more about Christ. Um, knowing more about his love for us. Verse 8 says, Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. We could spend a whole lot of time right here. Especially on the, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. But I'm not going to. Tonight, honestly, there are the basically three camps. Completeness is when we get to heaven. Completeness is the return of Christ. And finally, completeness was, was the completion of the Bible. Um, to me, again, it makes no sense. Why would the New Testament include so much about spiritual gifts if spiritual gifts were not for today? If the age of gifts were going to end with the Bible, they wouldn't have bothered including it, especially so thoroughly in the New Testament. And then why would some gifts end and, and, and other gifts continue? Um, and finally, why would we need less gifts today because of having the Bible? I look at it, if, if Paul saw the need in his day, we certainly have that same need uh, for spiritual gifts today. But you know what? I'm fine either way. I know what I believe. Um, and, and, uh, and again, my focus is always on Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You don't want to believe in gifts, that's fine. But um, I'm just telling you from my experiences, from my looking at scriptures, that's the way I believe. Um, so, but what does matter is also this. I do not believe spiritual gifts can properly be operated in without agape love. You see, spiritual gifts are not for self-edification, but for the edification and building of the body of Christ and for evangelism. Self-edification is a form of self-love. Um, but edification of others, the motivation is always going to be agape love. So you can't separate. You have to have all gifts operating that are centered upon agape love. That's how we can be more like Christ, and that's what Christ showed us. Verse 13 says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Again, great verse. Why is love the greatest? It's obvious. It's because it's the heart of the other two. Imagine faith without love. No. Um, hope without love? No. Love is the center of my faith. Love is the center of my hope. And my hope is what? In the soon bodily return of my Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14 one says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Notice what it says. Follow the way of love and, again, it, it, it's an encouragement to follow, um, eagerly follow the gifts of the Spirit and especially prophecy. So Paul's saying just what I said, love is at the center of all. You have love and then you have the gifts. You have to operate the gifts through love. That agape love motivates me to be all that I can be for Christ and for the body of Christ. And out of that love, my gifts come. And then, if I was to guess, I would believe Paul is addressing something specific. It was a Corinthian thing. Sounds like some who spoke in tongues believed that they were better than those who had other gifts. 
spiritual gifts, and Paul sets them straight. Again, he doesn't state anything about the temporary nature of gifts, just to those who think their gift is, quote, more spectacular. Um, he says that tongues, basically he's saying this, I'm going to put it in Skip Holt's terms, tongues without an interpretation is kind of worthless. It edifies the speaker in other tongues, and we also see that those who don't know Christ can be drawn to the Lord, but prophecy speaks to the strengthening, encouraging, and comfort of others. But Paul also says in verse 5, I would like every one of you to speak in tongue. Again, it's hard to say it's not for today if Paul's wanting everybody to speak in tongue. But then he does add, but I'd rather have you prophecy, prophesy. Again, he doesn't rule out tongues or prophecy. He then restates it this way. So it is with you in verse 12. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. But then again, in verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So while stating that tongues edifies the speaker and prophecy the body, we must be careful when we say something against that, tongues, which Paul says he basically used on a daily basis. It's hard to say it's outdated, not for today. If Paul needed it, um, I think we need it. Um, he further corrects and teaches the church in, in Corinth. He says, verse 20, Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. Regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking be adults. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. Just like I mentioned above, tongues are a sign for unbelievers as well as self-edification. Paul then shares kind of a neat thing, an insight, if you will, of what a New Testament church might have very well been like. Verse 26, What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or interpretation? Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak one at a time and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church to speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh in carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirit of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace, as in all congregation of the Lord's people. Now, I don't see anywhere in Scripture that it's saying that a, a, a service must be like this, but I think it's kind of uh, special because it, Paul is giving us kind of an insight of what I would say both a lot of services were like and what um, services could be like. Um, again, if, if, if prophecy and, and, and tongues, interpretation, if those gifts were not for today, I doubt they would have a description of what a church service very well could be like. Paul then mentions women should remain silent in the churches, for it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Let me just share another verse. Remember 1 Corinthians eleven five. But every woman who prays or prophesies, prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. So, 1 Corinthians 11 is saying women who pray in and prophesy. And now they're saying here should remain silent. So the scripture, there's order in scripture. And the scripture is the word of the Lord. So I think what we would have to see here is that when he was talking in, in verse 34, the, that key is submission. He was It was a cult, cultural thing, number one that the submission was a wife to a husband. So he was basically saying to a married woman, ask the husband. But again, this is cultural. Verse 39, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy, and do not forbid, do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. And in closing, I do believe that this is accurate and it's great advice for the church of today. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for, for faith, hope, and of course, love. Lord, we are grateful that, that 
the way that you desire us to interact, whether it is with within our family, within the workplace, community, or with other people, is to operate through the very heart of love. That, that giving us that agape, unconditional, sacrificial love for those around us. And Lord, it doesn't come natural. But Lord, we need it. For Lord, if we are to be using our gifts in this world, we have to first and foremost have love. Lord, I just pray that you will help each and every one of us to develop that agape heart of love that we might then reach out to this world. Lord, we do pray. We pray um, so much is going on. Lord, a Supreme Court judge, the elections, our president and, and his wife, and um, with, with COVID-19, Lord, there's so much going on. But Lord, we just pray. We don't have answers. I don't have answers, but you are the answer. Lord, I pray for revival, that, Lord, that you will touch hearts and lives to, to have a, a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, that, Lord, that we will seek ye first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, that, Lord, we will recognize, Lord, how much we need you. We need you in our hearts and in our lives, in our churches and in our communities and in this country, Lord. Lord, stir our hearts, and I thank you for, for Paul's wonderful words tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. It's great to have you with me tonight.